Okay, so um, how does your how does your journey continue? Yeah, so I uh, I went away for one semester to um, Colorado State University, which is up in Fort Collins, and so I moved out of the house. And so by this point, I had told my parents, like, yeah, I don't believe in the church, and um, they had said, well, if you live at home, you have to go to church. So I moved away, um, stopped going to church, was, you know, just doing, you know, my studies up there. Um, I felt kind of alone. I didn't know a ton of people and I'm, I'm a little bit of an introvert, so it's kind of hard to, um, make friends. And so I was feeling a little isolated. And while I was up there, like halfway through the semester, um, I got a call from my dad one night and, my mom uh, was in the hospital. She had leukemia. And so she had gone in. It was uh, really advanced. So she had gone in just to the doctor because she was feeling really, you know, lethargic. And they admitted her to the hospital, you know, ran some blood work. And she had leukemia. And she started chemo, you know, like right away. And so that was kind of a powerful experience for me. Um, I felt a lot of guilt, like, well, maybe it was because I stopped going to church and because I stopped believing, um, you know, like maybe it was my fault. And so I internalized a lot of that guilt. And um, after the semester, I moved back home to help out with my little sister and just kind of help out around the house. Um, my dad was a pilot and so he was, he'd be gone sometimes. And so, uh, I took two years off of school and just moved back home. Um, and just really wanted to, okay, let me kind of start going back to church and, um, you know, maybe then my mom will be okay. And, um, you know, she, yeah, she's fully recovered now. And, um, but yeah, that was kind of a big moment. And so then I was at home for a couple of years. I was just feeling really like I had no direction, you know, cause I wasn't in school. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I had had this experience two years earlier where I kind of, okay, let me come back to church. But then the doubts kept creeping up and I still didn't know if I believed. And so I just wanted to kind of get away. And so I booked a plane to Spain, um, booked a flight there with a return date three months later. And I didn't know where I was going to stay. I didn't know what I was going to do. Uh, I just saved up some money and, um, I didn't tell my parents until two days before I left. And so I, I, I thought I just need to make a journey. I need to go do something. I need to get away to kind of figure out what am I going to do with my life? And so I went and lived in Madrid, um, found a place with like nine other students, you know, people from France and Scotland. And so I was just kind of there. Um, I, w I wasn't really doing a lot of church stuff, but I had brought like my dad's little serviceman book of Mormon that he had taken to desert storm. So I, I had had that cause I told my mom I'd bring it. And that's kind of like, I didn't think I was actually going to do it, do anything with it, but I just had some downtime, and so I kind of started reading it, and I was like, well, maybe it's true, and I didn't, you know, I need, I knew I needed to go back to school, and so I thought, well, I'll, I want it to be true, I'll go to BYU, I'll be around, you know, people that are like-minded, and um, I'll just kind of learn about it, and I'll come back, and, and so I applied to BYU and got in and, and moved, moved to Utah, moved to Provo. And you were at BYU how many years? Uh, so I did end up being like four years because I had changed transferring schools two times and then changing my major, um, took four years at BYU. And did you meet your wife at BYU? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Okay. So we both worked at BYU in the data center. Um, so we would, you know, if a server went down or whatever, you'd have to log in. And so it was like a 24 seven kind of operation there. And so, um, yeah, I was like a supervisor and she was one of the new P 
people on my shift. And so that's how we met and um, got married, yeah, in 2010. So coming up on eight years. And so how many years into your marriage did your faith crisis sort of begin? So, yeah. So, I, I mean, I've had a, I had a couple kind of bouts of inactivity and doubt. And um, but then I was like, OK, I'm at BYU. You know, I'm going to I want it to be true. I'm going to live it. I'm going to. But I never could really. It was always really hard for me to to go to church. Um, I'm just so shy. And so that was always hard to like to be around a big group of, of people. Um, and so I, I always really struggled with that. And so I'd feel guilty about not going to church and, but I'd feel anxious if I went to church. And so it was, it was a really hard struggle for me, but, um, then I met my wife and made this really renewed effort to, you know, while we were dating to go to church and to do everything I was supposed to. And, um, and so then, you know, um, got the Melchizedek priesthood because I'd never gotten that. I got my patriarchal blessing because I'd never gotten that. And then, um, so we're engaged. And a week before our wedding, we both go to the temple. And um, that was like a giant weight on my shelf, like going through the temple for the first time. What was wrong with the temple? <laughs> um, it's just, you don't know what's going on. And, um, you know, they say, hey, if you don't want to be here, you don't have to be here. But you don't know what's going to happen. You're like, I don't know what's going to happen. So I was like, I don't know if I want to be here, but <laughs> I can't like walk out because my father-in-law is right next to me and my wife, you know, wife to be, we're going to getting married in a week. She's right there. She's going to see if I leave. And, um, just a lot of anxiety. Uh, I just, I never, yeah, I had had a really, really bad experience there. Never even afterwards throughout my, you know, the, the years never really enjoyed the temple. It was always, always caused a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety for me to go. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so that was a big wait, but we got married and, um, then I, I had kind of told her, you know, my wife, like I told her about my cutting and some of my issues with depression. And she, she had said, you know, like, you know, it's okay. Just, you know, don't cut again and things should be okay. And so I was like, okay. And so <laughs> the first year of marriage, right? I'm in school, I'm studying computer science. It's hard. You're poor and recently married. Um, I think there's also a lot of like sexual shame that comes in about like this whole time you're engaged. You're like, can't do anything bad, can't do anything bad. And then all of a sudden overnight, it's like, oh, wait, we can. And so it was just kind of like a lot of, uh, I don't know, it was kind of difficult to that first couple years of marriage. And so I knew I couldn't cut. Um, but I was depressed and stressed out from school. And so I turned to food and I gained a lot of weight. Um, just, I would just eat, you know, is that self-medicating? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like if I, you know, if I eat a whole Domino's pizza or whatever, like each bite, you know, it's tasting good. And that was kind of how I was getting through those first couple of years. And yeah, I gained a lot of weight and felt really bad about it, right? Because I, I don't want to be like this. I like being active. And so um, then I... If I could just pause you for yeah. one second. Um, something that was really uh, not intuitive for me and somewhat sophisticated that I was told by one of my trainers once as a psychologist was... Your goal when you have a client who is cutting is not necessarily to get them to stop cutting. And my, I was like, what are you talking about? That's the only goal. Um, and what, what the, my trainer told me was that sometimes cutting is what's keeping them alive. 
And I, I, you know, I was just like taken really back. But again, if, if they're feeling so much distress that the, the cutting helps numb it, if you just take the, the cutting away and there's nothing that replaces it, they're back to feeling that it, those extreme levels of distress that then can become overwhelming. And so the goal isn't purely to just stop the cutting. It would be to, to have them transition from uh, cutting as a form of coping um, and of distress tolerance and, and, and a sort of stress management to less harmful, more healthy forms of coping and management of their distress. And so you don't want to just, so, you know, that makes sense when you say that you couldn't cut, you had to stop. Well, that doesn't take away the sadness and the pain. And so conversion will happen where you just develop some other form of self-medicating. And I guess, fortunately, you could say you found food, but then that has its own problems, right? Yeah, yeah. So I, yeah, I got to the point where I was almost like 300 pounds. And so I knew something had to happen and I needed to make a change. And so... I'm kind of like, just kind of my personality. I said, I, re I had read this book. And so I was like, I'm going to cut out all meat, all dairy, all animal products. So overnight I went cold turkey. Uh, I guess no pun intended there. <laughs> um, and yeah, I haven't eaten meat in the six years since. Um, so I kind of had made that change and started working out and um, so that was kind of like senior year of college and the first year of, of, uh, post-college. Um, and so that was kind of this time where I was actually feeling good cause I was eating right. Uh, I was exercising. I wasn't really depressed. Um, all of a sudden you're not so poor cause you're getting the real big boy job or whatever. Right. And so I just felt like my stress levels went down a lot and I was in a good place. Um, and that lasted a, a couple years. Um, we were still going to church, but now you don't need to go to church to get your ecclesiastical endorsement. And so I would sometimes not go as often. And I'd still had some of these doubts, um, you know, about, about the faith and theology. And so it kind of turned into one of these things where like, just going to church would get really make me really anxious and I just wasn't enjoying it and I would get really bad headaches. And, um, so it was like every Sunday, it started to be like every Sunday where I'd tell my wife, like, I don't feel good. I'm sick. You know, you have to go without me. And so that was kind of the beginning of my faith crisis there. And then, um, just started finding out about you know, history and kind of some of the thorny issues and just led me right down the, the faith crisis. And so that was probably two or three years ago that that started. I'll bring a couple of listeners in just with their comments. Um, Becky asks, will the church ever stop obsessing about masturbation? Let's hope. Uh, if they do, it'll be because of the work of people like Natasha and Sam Young and uh, others. Um, Marin writes, I can really relate to you, Matt. I have dealt with depression since I was young also. Thank you for sharing your story. Patricia writes, I was 14 when my depression started. Uh, I came home early from a mission because of depression. Um, Jennifer writes, uh, Matt, you're a beautiful person. I've dealt with uh, people who cut before. I understand that inflicting pain on yourself or hurting yourself in a physical way is like trying to make yourself feel a physical pain versus an emotional pain. People can sometimes see a physical injury uh, when they don't see a mental injury. Um, so that's um, that's helpful. Um, Megan Berto, Bert, Berto, yeah, is sister. that your is yeah. that your sister? Yeah, she's listening. Oh, and commenting. Hey, hey, Megan. <laughs> She says, for me, self-harm was brought about by an extreme sense of self-loathing and wanting to punish myself. It's sad how prevalent this is. I didn't even know Matt did this until many, many years later. Yeah. So you, oh, thank you, Megan, for sharing something so sensitive. You and Megan were both really struggling and you couldn't even talk to each other about it. Yeah. Yeah. She was the, I think the first person in my family that I eventually told. And, yeah. 
Yeah. And that doesn't necessarily mean it, it was a genetic thing, but there's there's two members of your family experiencing so much distress that that is what they independently arrived at without even um, sort of influencing each other necessarily. Okay. Um, and Megan says hi back. Uh, Amelia writes, it's nice to hear other people that have similar stories to me. For so long, I thought I was the only one. So we're very glad, Amelia, that um, that this could happen. Okay, Natasha, let's let you jump in. Is there anything you want to uh, add or interject uh, as Matt's telling a story? Well, I just wanted to second all the things that you said about cutting and the treatment of cutting. I think one of the things that people most inappropriately or just from misinformation correlate with cutting a suicidality. They see it as suicidal behavior. It is not suicidal behavior. You might be suicidal and cutting, but they're two very different things. Um, and it is a coping mechanism. And I always tell my parents of adolescents or my people who are doing that behavior that that is not our primary goal. Our primary goal is to actually kind of lay off the pressure of not cutting and we're going to focus on other aspects of your life. Love it. Thank you, Natasha. Okay, so oh, and, oh please. And, sorry. And I'm, my list of problems within Mormon culture are, is getting bigger as you're talking. <laughs> so I'll, I'll get to that eventually. <laughs> wow. It's after I, you've been doing this for a long time. I imagine that list is lengthy. So I can't believe we're adding to it. But uh, <laughs> um, so so Matt. Uh, was going through a faith crisis exacerbating to the depression or alleviating? How did you experience it? It was definitely exacerbating. And so, I mean, so I'm starting to go through the beginning stages of this faith crisis. And I had just, you know, been losing a lot of weight. Um, and so I was kind of stressed about what, you know, things I was finding. And so I, and, you know, I couldn't cut. And now I didn't want to use food to cope. And so I went, you know, to the extreme end where I started using restriction of food as my coping mechanism. Um, and, you know, it kind of makes sense because I've, I've lost all this weight and you start getting compliments. And so it just kind of feeds itself. And so I, yeah, I kind of then started developing an eating disorder where I would try to restrict my calories. Um, and it's, yeah, you, your last, uh, interview with Jen, she kind of touched on this, but, um, it was just another way for me to kind of take control and to, um, distract myself from, from these feelings I was having. And so I would, yeah, just restrict my food and, um, food just consumed my life you know, number of calories I was eating and how much I was exercising. And, um, you know, they have these apps now where, you know, you, my fitness pal or whatever, you can put in how much you exercise and how much you eat and kind of see in this gamified way. If, if, uh, you know, am I, am I good for the day, quote unquote. And so, um, that just kind of worsened and it was consuming everything and, um, uh, I also kind of developed body dysmorphia, um, just from having lost the weight. And I thought, well, I, sh I weigh this much now, like I should look better when, you know, in the mirror, when I look at myself, I should look better. And I just would notice all the flaws and, uh, you know, I just hated what I saw. And so, um, yeah, I don't know, Natasha, if you want to jump in and talk about body dysmorphia you have anything to add on that? I think you're doing a great job of describing that. I mean, it's exactly right where we, what you look like in the mirror to yourself is not necessarily how other people perceive you. I think we all have that a little bit, <laughs> you know, where we tend to be somewhat more critical of ourselves than the general population would be of us. Uh, we notice, you know, wrinkles or um, fat cells or, you know, whatever it is, but it can really be, um, when you get to the clinical diagnosis of this, it's obviously at a whole nother level where it's really almost like a, a delusion in a sense of how you actually perceive yourself. And it's very harmful. And um, of course, deals with a lot of the different um, eating disorders like anorexia, bulimia, nervosa, 
um, binging disorder, et cetera. Yeah. So yeah, that was my, my eating disorder and body dysmorphia. Um, that was kind of how I was coping for the next couple of years as I was going kind of through this faith crisis and going down the rabbit hole and learn, you know, learning all these thorny history situations. Let me ask you just something very, that may be obvious, but I want you just to kind of go into it. Why would, um, a faith crisis, what was it about your faith crisis that was causing you distress that was, uh, that possibly bringing on the depressive symptoms? What were the things, the components to that? Yeah. Um, so I think, A big one is just how secret I had to keep it. Um, I couldn't really talk to anyone, right? Because most of my friends are LDS. I can't talk to, you know, my parents about it. Can't talk to my wife about it. You know, what is my wife going to think if I I say I'm not sure if the church is true? And so you just feel like you're the only one in this situation. And, you know, everyone else is going to church and happy. And, you know, you're finding out this distressing information and I can't tell anyone, I can't do anything about it. I, I just have to live with that. And so I have to keep up appearances, you know, for my family, for my wife, but inside, you know, I'm feeling all these, all these emotions and I can't let it out. I can't talk to anyone about it. And so I just needed a way to, to cope with it. Yeah. And I'm just going to say, we'll talk about Maybe my recommendations for depression and a faith crisis, Natasha, I'm sure you'll have yours as well. But, you know, one of the reasons, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the Mormon Stories catalog and there's like 900 and what, 20, 30 episodes now. And we've done so many episodes on people's faith journey. And I'm, I'm wondering why we have more listeners to Mormon Stories now than we've ever had, in spite of the fact that I was excommunicated. Um in spite of the fact that there's now so much competition for podcasts and yet we have the best download rates ever. We did the Mormon stories did something like 5.2 or 3 million downloads and views last year, um, which is crazy. And it was like, you know, 50% growth over the year before. And, um, and what people keep telling me, they're like, I can't get enough of these faith journey stories. I, I, it doesn't matter how long they are, the longer, the better. And I try and get a sense for why. And what they tell me is listening to someone else's faith story helps me feel like I'm not alone. Helps me feel like I'm not crazy. Helps me process emotionally what I'm going through. And so many of these people don't have anyone to talk to. You can't talk to your spouse. You don't want to wreck the marriage. They may leave you. You may be scared that they'll leave you. Or you may try and talk about it. They get mad, blow up, uh, you know, um, it can be disruptive to your job. Um, it can be disruptive to a family. It can make your parents freak out. You can worry about disappointing your mom or your dad who may be older. Uh, you may be judged by your siblings. Um, you know, and so people feel desperately, they feel broken. They feel like nobody else understands. They feel completely alone. And so one intervention for depression in a faith crisis can be listening to people's faith journeys on podcasts. Um, And more importantly, it's not to plug podcasts. It's to reflect what you're telling me, which is that you couldn't talk to anyone and you felt broken and alone and desperate. Yeah, exactly. And I remember distinctly one, one day at work and um, super depressed thoughts of suicidality, wondering, you know, would it be better if I killed myself? Cause then at least, you know, my family, my wife, my parents, they, they wouldn't know that, you know, I'm not a believer, you know, things like that. And, you know, so these thoughts are running through my head and I had put on, uh, it was just after your interview with Jesse stay. And I just kind of had it on while I was working. Um, just kind of like, on the verge of tears, on the verge of breaking down at work. And he, he just said like, fine, you know, there's, there's people out there, there's community out there. And he had said, you know, you can email me. And just that moment, I thought just him saying, you can email me. It made me realize that I wasn't alone. And so that just gave me enough strength that I could, 
get through that day. I thought, May, okay, that gave me some hope. Like maybe there's community out there. And so that's kind of when I went online and I found um, UVPM, Utah Valley Post Mormons. And so started going to some of the coffee meetups and meeting other people in my situation. And so I, I understand because I was there, you know, like I had really bad thoughts of suicide and super depressed. And it was, you know, just hearing an interview where someone said, reach out to me if you want to. So if anyone's out there, you can reach out to me. Like you're not alone. So, Yeah, I just tagged Jesse Stay. So shout out to Jesse. Thanks for being awesome and being there for Matt. Um, huge shout out to Steve Holbrook and the Utah Valley post-Mormon community. I, you're you're kind of given my list of recommendations for a faith crisis. You need to find someone you can talk to. If it isn't a spouse or a friend or a close family member, you need to find someone. Uh, you know, um, Natasha Helfer Parker, uh, you know, go to natashaparker.org. Um, She's a, a coach and a therapist. Uh, I have a therapy practice at johndolin.com, a coaching practice. I do faith crisis coaching. My wife, Margie, at uh, beautyinthenow.org. She has a, a coaching practice. She's just gotten her license. There are professionals out there who have an expertise, as, as Natasha says, cultural competence in Mormon faith crises and significant expertise in listening and, and counseling people. And we just want to tell you, you don't need to go through this alone. If you don't have a friend or a family member, reach out uh, to a therapist. Uh, you can go to mormonfaithcrisis.com uh, uh, and, and we have a, a list of uh, options there. But please get help. You can also go to Natasha Parker's um, uh, Symmetry Solutions. Um, and you can go to the Mormon Mental Health Association website. There are all sorts of different ways you can find and get the support you need. Um, but but finding a friend in a community is a, is a great way to do that. And I'm really glad Utah Valley Post-Mormon community is there. And also, if you go to mormonspectrum.org slash map, there's this map of the entire world with all these pushpins. And if you live in Sacramento or if you live in L.A. or if you live in New York or Provo or Cache Valley, Logan, it uh, doesn't matter where you live, likely there's a community of liberal, progressive, and post-Mormons who you can join the group and, and meet up with them. You're not alone. You can also join many of the online communities. If you're trying to remain engaged in Mormonism, there's the a Thoughtful Faith um, Facebook group you can join um, if you meet their criteria. That's run by some great people. There's the Mormon Stories podcast community, which has something like 12,000 members. It's one of the largest Facebook groups in Mormonism. There's ex-Mormon Reddit that you can go on to anonymously uh, under a pseudonym to sort of vent and to share concerns and frustrations. There's Thoughtful Transitions Facebook group. Um, there's a Facebook group for mixed faith marriages. Uh, there are so many different Facebook groups, uh, internet groups, forums, face-to-face -face groups. You are not alone and you don't have to be alone. And again, email Matt, email me, email Natasha. I'm Dr. John Delin at gmail.com. Natasha, what's your email? N Helfer Parker at gmail.com. Matt, you want to give your email? Matt Berto at gmail.com. All right. Yeah. Reach out. Uh, you don't have to be alone. And a shout out to everyone who's there for other people because that's important. Okay. Well, and this goes this goes back directly to the where we first started, right? Which is why religions do well with people and mental health when people feel like they fit in their religion, when they feel like they're um, finding meaning and purpose and value and they resonate with their religion, they tend to do better. But a big part of that is the community. So we need to replicate the same thing on the other side, right? So community is so important. Isolation is a killer for everybody. And so um, this is why this, everything that John just mentioned, I would second, because whether it's just listening to somebody or group therapy or podcast uh, groups that you're a participant in or in person if possible just makes a huge difference and if you are coming out like any like I talk to anybody who's coming out about anything you know whether you're coming out about being gay or coming out about being um, in a faith transition if you don't feel like your initial your immediate circle is going to be supportive of that find somebody who is supportive of that first so that when and if that doesn't go well, you have somebody to kind of have your back. 
Thanks, Natasha. Patty writes, uh, there is not as much help for those not living in Utah. And that's probably true, but that's why we have Skype and Zoom. And so you can, you can find a local therapist or coach, but you could also reach out to a coach like me, like my wife, Margie, like Natasha, uh, lots of coaches um, and therapists provide support and treatment over, over Skype or Zoom. Uh, and and so you don't have to be alone. Also, Patty, there are Facebook support groups in Dallas, um, in Houston. I don't know how far Dallas and Houston are, lo- are from Lubbock. Um, I should know that because I lived in Texas for most of my life. But uh, but you can come to the Houston retreat in July. We're having a Mormon Stories uh, retreat in July. And you can meet fellow Texans at that retreat. Um, you can go to mormonstories.org slash events. And that's one of the reasons we have these events to help people meet each other and to make it so um, it's only a little bit away. And if you, Patty, want to start a, um, a Mormon transitions or Mormon faith crisis support group in Lubbock, all you have to do is create one. Let me and the Mormon Spectrum community know and they will they will post a link to your group. I'll post a link to your group from Facebook. Other people will post a link and we'll find people from Lubbock uh, for you, Patty, to be friends with. Uh, and that's not just Lubbock, that's people all over the world. So if you need support, don't stay suffering. Reach out to us. That's why the Open Stories Foundation is here. Email me at mormonstories at gmail.com, drjohndelin at gmail.com. Um, we'll find you friends in a support group. So how, so how did your faith crisis slash depression progress, Matt? Um, yeah, so eventually, um, I kind of came out to my wife and told her like, you know, I don't believe in the church and, um, it was right before the mixed faith marriage retreat that, that you put on you and Julie. And so, um, I asked my wife, like, do you want to go to this? And she agreed. And so, so we went to it and, um, I guess a little bit before that I had started going to therapy, um, my wife and my sister kind of, uh, I, they didn't push me into it, but they kind of said it might be helpful for me. And they, you know, we going into it, I was just kind of, and they were kind of just concerned about like the eating disorder kind of thing. And so I started going to therapy. Um, and we kind of found out like, yeah, the eating disorder might just be, you know, the, a symptom of something underneath, it might be the most visible symptom. And so that's what people are concerned about, but you need to kind of work the underlying issues. And so that was kind of dealing with, you know, this faith crisis, dealing with being in a mixed faith marriage. And so, um, yeah, we went to the mixed faith marriage retreat. We enjoyed it. Uh, it was difficult. Um, we do, therapy together and, um, therapy individually. And, um, so I thought like once I would be able to tell her, like for a little bit, it it felt good because I was able to get it off my chest and finally tell someone, but then it was kind of the living this mixed faith marriage was, was kind of hard. Um, just because now, you know, my wife kind of starts doubting, you know, my character, you know, like, oh, well, if you're not a member of the church, how do you have any kind of sense of morality? And now you're not a member of the church, like, what's to stop you from just going and cheating on me? And um, so that was really hard to kind of overnight kind of now be doubted my character and my integrity. Um, And so that was difficult to deal with. And um, so, yeah, in the last year, my depression got really bad. My suicidality got really bad. Um, It got to the point where it was kind of a a constant in the back of my mind, just like suicidal thoughts. Um, You know, from the time I woke up to the time I went to bed, in, in between just thinking about killing myself. Um, 
And so then I, my therapist, after a few months, six months, something like that, she suggested I see a psychiatrist and she recommended me out. And um, so I went there and started some medications. And uh, for six weeks, I was on a dosage of a medicine. And that was one of my lowest points because... I thought, okay, I went to therapy and that didn't really help. And so then I went to, you know, went to a psychiatrist. I'm on medications. That's not really helping. And so I just felt really hopeless. Like maybe nothing will help. Like, and so during those six weeks, I really thought like it almost felt like a certainty, like I will die by suicide. Like that is how it's going to end for me. And, um, hmm. yeah, that was tough. Really tough. Hmm. Um, suicide is something that's very, very tricky. Uh, on the one hand, most people, 90 plus percent of people, as I understand it, have suicidal ideation at various points in their lives. And so just, just having the thoughts could actually, is actually very normal. Um, and, you know, and of course, those types of thoughts will be exacerbated, you know, when you're having, you know, really, really distress, distressful times in your life. What, uh, what is something to kind of be aware of and to watch out for is there's kind of a threshold where you're having the thoughts, you're having the ideation, um, but you have no desire or intent to ever act upon it. It's just the thoughts that you have when it gets serious for yourself or for others is when you start actually thinking about ways that you might do it, making plans uh, to do it. Um, and that's when, that's when you know that it's really time to seek help. Natasha, do you have any, any uh, kind of best practices or additional thoughts around suicidality? I would second everything you just said about suicidality. Um, I think I want to talk a little bit about treatment. What you're what you're mentioning, Matt, is that oftentimes the treatment for depression is a little bit lengthy. In fact, you know, in, in the in the idea of finding the right medication, finding the right therapist, like when you're dealing with suicidal ideation and it's taking you know six to ten weeks to six months to get some type of relief from these therapies, it can feel extremely frustrating um, and why I encourage people to get treatment sooner than later, right? And then there's a certain part of the population that we call treatment resistant. That's not to mean that you're resistant, um, like rebellious. It means that the treatments for whatever reasons are not having the type of impact that we want to see in the mental health community as far as, you know, seeing you improve in your symptoms. So um, I think, you know, one of the ways to think about treatment is if you're kind of in the mild, um, general mild clinical depression categories, you know, talk therapies can be very effective. If you start getting into moderate, um, that's when you probably want to get some type of medical assessment. There are a lot of great medications. And oftentimes the research shows that both the talk therapies in conjunction with the medications tend to have the best results long term. Um, and then, of course, there are um, more intensive treatments, such as electroconvulsive therapies, which can sound really scary and weird, you know, like brings up all these images of the old <laughs> mental health institutions, right, with people getting their brains kind of shocked. But there's actually a lot, you know, it, and like I mentioned, your brain is a biochemistry type of organ, right? It has electricity in it running through it. And there are some really actually very effective treatments for severe depression. So getting good um, kind of team approaches to, to severe or treatment resistant depression is very important. So a psychiatrist, a therapist, um, you know, nutritionist, sometimes it can be really important to attack this from lots of different levels. There is a, a bit of a thing, a stigma in Mormonism, and probably in the world, some people just think medications are bad, you shouldn't do medications, it means you're broken, it means you're weak. Two quick things about that. One is, if you have if you have you know diabetes, are you going to take the insulin? Like, there are physical 
uh, conditions where medication is is really the only treatment. And I have seen SSRIs save lives, especially when you're experiencing to the point of suicidal ideation that's that's actually significant. And then also, um, also uh, in addition, um, not only that, but sorry, we have a spider that's just uh, coming down from the light and it's a big one. So I'm asking Tim <laughs> to... Uh, to humanely deal with the spider. Um, so in addition uh, uh, to, um, to the realization that, that medication can save your life and shouldn't be stigmatized, just like you might need it for um, diabetes or some other condition, sometimes we just need it to get the right serotonin levels in our bodies uh, so that we can, can function. Um, the only other thing I'll say is that uh, it, it sometimes takes time. It, it sometimes takes trying different medicines, different doses. And so you don't, um, and sometimes some SSRIs in some populations can actually um, increase suicidality and you have to watch that. And so, uh, you know, finding the right medication is really significant. And then I'll just say that normally it's generally understood that what medication does is it takes the edge off it takes you to a functioning level, um, but it doesn't cure whatever the underlying condition is, especially if you're dealing with something that's very situational. So you don't want probably to put yourself in a situation where all you're doing is self-medicating through SSRIs uh, indefinitely. As Natasha said, the best outcomes, uh, sometimes you can get as good of an outcome for mild to moderate depression with just talk therapy, um, as you, or, or coaching, depending on whether it's, you know, treating the, the, um, you know, the d mental disorder or the conditions that are affecting, uh, your life. So, you know, either one, both can work, but, uh, regardless, um, you, you usually don't want to just take an SSRI without psychotherapy. You usually want to take them in conjunction with each other. Um, if you're going to be taking an SSRI, um, uh, and I'll so, just mention exercise as well as a huge component of uh, being able to treat depression effectively. Not just exercise, but eating right. And so one of the most beautiful things you can do, treat yourself in multiple ways, is just once a day for 30 minutes to an hour, get on an elliptical or go take a walk, bring your iPhone or your Android and listen to a podcast. And you're double, <laughs> you're double treating yourself. Um, and then if you add eating right and getting good sleep, it, they've actually found that just exercising and eating right and getting enough sleep can actually sometimes be more effective than having a therapist or taking SSRIs, again, for mild to moderate depression. Um, and so these are all things that can be really useful. But going back to suicidality, what's really serious is when the person is actually, um, and, and I actually have a list here of signs that you can use for yourself or that um, you can identify in others to know when when they're sort of uh, showing signs of suicidality. So a sudden switch from sadness to extreme calmness or appearing to be happy. So if they've been sad for a long time and all of a sudden there's a switch and they're extremely calm and maybe even happy, that's something to look into. They could be better or uh, they could be at risk for suicide always talking or thinking about death, clinical depression, deep sadness, loss of interest, trouble sleeping, that gets worse, taking risks that could lead to death, such as driving through red lights or just sort of increased uh, risky um, behaviors, making comments about being hopeless, helpless, or worthless, putting affairs in order, like uh, tying up loose ends or uh, changing a will, saying things like it would be better if I weren't here or I want out, uh, talking about suicide, visiting or calling close friends and loved ones as if you're kind of preparing to kind of end things. And uh, maybe just the last thing I'll say about that is uh, do your best to help this person or to help yourself get help. Um, and and in, in the case of suicidality, you don't want to just go with a coach. You want to go with a psychologist and or a psychiatrist, a mental health professional who's licensed, who can treat you for a severe depression and a mood disorder. 
And um, last case scenario, if you or someone you know is you have a reason to believe that they are going to take their life, you call 911 or you drive them to the hospital. Hospitals have, or the University of Utah, they have what's called a behavioral health unit. And in these units, I think it's called uni uh, at University of Utah, but you can be admitted, you or a loved one can be admitted to a hospital or to these behavioral health units. They will give you 24 hour uh, supervision. Uh, they will give you the medication you need and they will help stabilize you and get you into the care you need. So 911 or literally driving yourself or a loved one to the hospital can be your friend if things get that bad. Definitely. The only things I would add to that is that um, for many people who die from suicide, it can be a very impulsive decision, especially for those who suffer from bipolar and are going through some type of manic episode. Also, adolescents tend to be more impulsive in just their brain development and developmental stages that they're in. So some of the some of the things that John just mentioned, which can be very applicable, especially for adults, are maybe not going to be applicable for everybody. And the last thing I'll say about that is I even though I think we all want to share that responsibility and help bear that burden, you know, of getting people help when they when we see these kinds of red flags. At the same time, I will say that, um, I mean, I've lost a few people to suicide in my practice. And if somebody is, you know, um, committed enough to that process, there's not much many of us can do about that. So I just say that from the process of I know a lot of people shame themselves when they've lost a loved one to suicide because they feel like they should have seen the signs or they should have done something. And I just want to tell people that at, at some level, there's only so much we can do to help somebody who's really got a plan. Yeah. And that was what I had to learn in my training is that ultimately this is hard. This is not fun, but the reality is if someone's going to take their life, they're going to take their life um, or they're going to fail trying to take their life and survive. But Ultimately, we can't control that. And so when you get in that position of finding out uh, that somebody's in that position, do, you know, do reasonable things that you can to help them, but also try and practice acceptance and self-soothing. Um, get them the resources they need, but realize that you can't ultimately prevent this um, and you can harm yourself or sometimes exacerbate the situation by trying to uh, ultimately um, prevent something that really is at the end of the day outside your power. And that's, that's something that as a therapist, you kind of have to come to grips with is that. Um, and again, to go back to where we started on this interview is one of the reasons why it's so difficult to see the language that comes from the church is when this medical illness is treated really like a spiritual issue. You know, somehow um, fasting or scripture reading or working on your spirituality is going to help this very medical concern. Um, and although you can read your scriptures while you're um, maybe healing from a broken leg, we know that reading scriptures is not gonna actually help the bones fuse back together, right? Any faster or sooner. And we just really don't talk about physical ailments the same way we do about mental illness within church um, culture. And, you know, Matt, when you mentioned, for example, some of the concerns your wife had, you know, when she's seeing you transition and you're, you know, leaving the faith and you're not having the same belief systems, it can be very difficult for somebody from within to not see that from the perspective of the self-fulfilling prophecies of, well, we've been told all of our lives, right? If you leave the church, you're going to go down the wrong path, you're going to have horrible things happen to you, you're going to be depressed, or you're going to be angry, or you're going to have contention from Satan. And so when you're coming at it from that perspective, from a believing member, that's where it's really challenging, because you have to be able to separate a physical illness, it's a mental illness with, that's medical from these kinds of cultural myths that we have and folklores that we have that really are not correlative at all. 